Hey everybody! Look, it's Dragon Quest XI! Hooray! So I thought I would go over some of the level design here in Dragon Quest XI because it's a great way to learn how to do level design on a budget. The Dragon Quest XI devs didn't have a lot of budget per level and you can really see them scrimping and saving and doing it very efficiently. So it's a great place to learn your affordable level dev. And let's go ahead and get started. Um, this is uh, my second time through this area, and that's because uh, OBS explodes violently when you attempt to record uh, Dragon Quest XI. It's, it's the grass. OBS can't handle this grass. I switched to a different encoder, but if there are still problems, um, you'll have to forgive me for any visual artifacting you might see. So I guess we'll start with the grass, since it's causing me all the trouble. Creating this kind of really nice, floofy, dense grass is something that you can do in every modern game engine, and it looks great. Uh, one of the things you'll notice is that the grass itself doesn't really have any sort of give as you walk through it. There's no shader to push the grass away from you as you move through it. But that's fine, because you've got the sound effect, which I don't know if you can hear, because I've got the sound turned way down, but you've got the sound effect of running through the grass, and that's really convincing. You don't need to add all of the visual flair. That said, it is pretty easy to make a grass shader that pushes away from the main character as you move. Um, so, you know, if you feel like you want to try that, go ahead. It's not too difficult. There are a little bit um, of those. These here, for example, push out of the way as you move through them. But the effect is really terrible, uh, and they shouldn't have even bothered. Um, so, you know, if you're given the option between this kind of weird popping and uh, not doing anything. Not doing anything is a better choice. Also keep in mind that you can always have particle effects come off of your feet based on the surface that you're on. So in addition to the sound, you could have grass fly up. Um, and that makes it really immersive. You don't have to have world-class grass in order to have this kind of fun, dense, thick grass. That said, keep in mind that coloring it like this will make OBS violently explode and your streamers will hate you forever. At least this one will. <laughs> Another thing worth noting is these trees. So, the way these trees look in the light is really good. Um, the way that they've got the light working with their objects. They've got a special shader in this game that does some... Uh, plays some fast and loose rules in terms of how the light hits the objects and how what shadows are uh, and aren't and that sort of thing. And here you can see it really illuminates the tree beautifully and it rim lights the rocks. But the trees themselves are really terrible, and I'm not sure why they chose to do this. If you can see that, it's just a 90 degree planes and a mirrored leaf texture. It's, um, it's kind of 2002 level trees. And that's really interesting, because you can do trees much better than that these days without a whole lot of extra effort. So, I'm not sure why they chose to do that. Maybe, maybe it was supposed to be like a reference to an older Dragon Quest game but um, I recommend you don't use that exact leaf layout. Uh, it, it really is not... It, it makes it look bad to me. Maybe other people won't notice it. So this is mostly a height map. Uh, everything I'm running on here is height map plus grass. This is all height map. Uh, over here at the edge, you can see that they've bordered the height map's edges with stone. Oh, if I can get through the trees, come on. Now I bet the encoder barfed on that. This is a good way to uh, do two things at once. The first is it keeps the player from trying to run off the cliff, and the second thing is that it hides the edge of the height map. Um, so generally speaking, your height map should not be what the player hits the edge of. You're, you're, the player should never see a sharp edge on your height map. If there is a sharp edge on your height map, like say a cliff, you need to put a mesh there. And that's because height maps are terrible at actually looking like edges. Uh, and we can actually go to this other, uh, where is it? Uh, it's upstairs. So if we go up these nice stairs and go over here, we can see a place where they didn't do that. And this is just raw height map. And it's not very convincing. It looks pretty bad. Um, it's made much worse by the fact that the grass texture and the actual grass itself stop lining up. So if you're trying to create an, a cliff face like this, just take a quick little Google uh, to figure out what cliff faces look like and then use actual meshes to simulate your cliff face. Uh, this is uh, pretty poor. It's not terrible, terrible because the textures work pretty well, but it's obviously just, um, just the height map. 
It's not sufficient for me. Uh, I really like edging my height maps with things, and so do most devs, um, including these guys. They just missed a couple of edges. These stairs are pretty convincing, and you can see what they've done is they got a couple of repeating stair loops. So if I put my head right here, and you can see this, this uh, groove right next to it, and then up here, it's the same one. See that? And so that is the repetition. They've got one, two, three, four, five, six stairs, and then they repeat. But if you look here, this is an inverted version of the stair we were just looking at. But it's not simply the same stair flipped. What they've done is they've used uh, the same texture and they flipped the texture, but it's a different mesh with a slightly different UV map, so it doesn't look the same. And you can see that here if you take a look at this brick and this brick. They're using the same texture mirrored, but... Get out of the way, lady. Uh, but they're not the same mesh, and that's a good way to do it. So you can always use the same texture on a new mesh and just make sure that it looks, you know, like it's put in a different spot and it'll look great. So if I don't, if I'm not terribly mistaken, I think that they just have one stair mesh and they loop it. Um, and that's fine. It works great. Now over here we've got this bridge. Oh, I've got some plot to go through. Get there. This bridge looks pretty good in a cartoony game like this one, and it's got some fun effects where as you walk across it, the steps, like, go down under your feet. Well, she's on it, so you can't tell, but you can see that. Really small little thing, it works pretty well. Uh, but if this was supposed to be a high-fidelity world, you would need to be more careful with textures on this, because this is a really flat-feeling uh, piece of wood. The, uh, the cords on it don't have any normal maps associated with them, and similarly the wood grain doesn't have any normal map depth. So you're left with something that feels extremely flat. Now this doesn't work too badly in this game because of the fakery they do with the various kinds of shadows and lighting, but it's not, um, it's not a great look in most games. So I would recommend that you definitely uh, take care to either use extra meshes or uh, some some normal maps when you're doing this kind of thing. But once again, this is just the same set of, uh, of slats, repeated and flipped and all sorts of angles. So it's like two or three different slats and they just flip and spin them um, and you can get a lot of reuse out of that. Uh, here's another spot where they've left the edge bare and what they're what their their idea here is that you'll run right up to the edge and look out and say ooh ah and I'm sure that's what most people do I just for me if you look over on the right hand side of the screen you can see that green wedge popping up over the grass that just goes to me and it's because I've made that exact setup too many times to count and it just is something I actually actively look for when I'm looking at my own levels. So when I look at someone else's levels, it makes me think, oh, that needs that needs something. That needs a mesh or a blocking uh, object or something. Uh, but anyway, quick trick, use fog. Not like the fall-off fog, but like volumetric haze. Uh, you can fake it with just a particle effect, or you can get yourself a nice volumetric fog library. Um, everything looks better with mist and fog. So if you can add it, add it. Uh, it will enhance any scene you put it in, and these guys use it all the time, and it looks great all the time. Uh, so I talked about a blocking mesh briefly, just so you know what I'm talking about. Uh, when you are doing edgings, you can do two things. You can either replace the edge with meshes like this, or you can add in a blocking mesh like that. So this isn't actually the edge. I can go over this blocking mesh. But because of where the blocking mesh is placed, and the size of the blocking mesh, and the hill that I am walking up, um, I can't really see the poor quality level beyond it. So if you put something like this at the edge of your level, the player will naturally gravitate towards it instead of past it. And if I'm not mistaken, very few people actually jump over onto this cliff. At least that's the, that's the intention, that tree branch is supposed to, uh, you know, just gently nudge you forward so you don't look too closely at that exact edge. And then hopefully you'll look at it when you're on the bridge, right? Ooh, uh, we'll talk more about water effects in a minute. 
Um, I'm hoping that I'm not making anybody seasick when I'm moving the mouse. It's set a little bit fast, and the grass is making the image blur, if I'm not mistaken, so it might be tough. Uh, so here you can see the same setup that we had uh, earlier, where it's the, um, the three stones, or the three steps, where it's this inverted one and then this original one, like I was talking. If I put my head in them, can you tell? Same stones, uh, same steps. So it looks like they come in packs of like three or four, and they just get slotted down wherever you need them. All right, so now we're about to learn something about battle. We'll finish off this battle first, and then I will talk about fences. By the way, drawing on these rocks is brilliant. Every time they draw on a rock, it looks great. Oh, uh, one little side note. I'm talking mostly about level designs, but when it comes to character designs, there are character designs that look good in 2D, and there are character designs that look good in 3D, and I really don't know why we're sticking with this guy's character designs in 3D. They just look really weird. In 2D they look great, because you can cheat, but in 3D you can't cheat as easily, and the result is that they really look like plastic dolls. Um, but the voice actress, uh, all the voice actors are fantastic in this so far. Uh, that really makes up for a lot when you've got a voice actor. And um, the characters still feel very realistic and alive despite their faces. And maybe that's just me. Maybe you guys don't feel that way. And I'm blanking on his name. Uh, it's the guy who does Dragon Ball Z character designs. I just can't remember his name for some reason. I'm sure that the comments uh, will tell me if anybody watches this. Sorry to include this fight. Uh, I don't really plan to edit this. It's kind of a stream of consciousness thing, and, um, you know, editing it would take four more hours. I wonder if there's a way to make this faster. Hooray. All right. So, uh... Now we're on to the, the first plateau of this particular um, region. Crikey. I have fun over there, dog, because that's not the way we're going. And that, I'll be. All right, so what we're going to do here is back up and talk about fences and picketed off areas. Now keep in mind that these are picketed off areas only in kind of... Um, visual sense. It's easy to walk into them, but because there are fences around them, they are picketed off logically, and that means that you can put something on one side and something on the other side and distinguish them. In this case, it's sunflowers, or, or daisies, or whatever these are. They're not sunflowers. And you can see over here they've done the same thing. They've cordoned off the area. When you're putting up fences, you've got quite a challenge, because you generally only have one or two fence meshes, and you just linking them up over and over and over, and it gets really repetitive really fast if you're not careful. What they've done here is they've been careful to keep the fences constantly turning. Now notice that they haven't been very careful in terms of making the fences uh, turn interlocking without like fading through each other. Um, Dragon Quest XI plays very fast and loose with meshes that just go through other meshes, and you can see that right here at the edge I'm facing, the two fences just literally cross through each other in a way that doesn't make any physical sense. But very few people are going to notice, so it's fine. Um, since the meshes constantly curve and go into this organic sweep, the player probably will notice the organic sweep more than the individual fences. In addition, the fences are um, obscured slightly and altered by having plants grow up through them and get hidden in long grass and more plants down here. And the same thing happens over here. You break it up by putting a stone cap, and then there's some high grass breaking it up, and then some flowers breaking it up. Uh, and now this part is a little bit loose, not, not, not quite as, as uh, well um, hidden. But basically, when you're putting together fences, you never want to have a long straight line. And that's true of everything. Anything where you've got a repeating mesh, you don't want a long straight line. If you curve the line, if you alter the exact placement, you know, move them up and down or tilt them up and down, um, those things work. Uh, you can also just try and hide the repetition by putting in non-repeating elements like sagebrush popping up through it. And often um, having something that caps off the fence or whatever repeating mesh you've got 
will help the player to uh, cap off that sort of run, and it won't feel terribly repetitious. Um, there are some more examples in the village, which will be a different different video, uh, which are better. The village is um, the village had more time spent on it because it's like a hub, but uh, this is um, still a pretty good example of how to do fences. Also notice. They've put in a lot of variations on um, their grass. So not only do they have different types of grass, uh, they're not afraid to go with short and tall and stuff like that. So it's not all just tall grass with different kinds of tall grass. They've got these patches which are clover, and those are much, much more compact. Uh, and then they've got the taller grass, and they've got some medium length grass, and they've got some sagebrush. And that's a really great way to do it. Um, you don't want to have things that are all the same height. So if you're putting together a bunch of grass, keep in mind that there will be patches of grass that are different height. Um, not just different color, different height. And the flame effects are surprisingly good. I like them. There's a treasure chest back there, but we're not going to get it. Because uh, this is a new save that I'm not going to keep. My character is named... Ah! So, you know, that's how seriously I'm taking this particular adventure. And look at that. Bear edge. So now we're entering the cave. Uh, this cave has a lot of really good design to it, so let's go ahead and talk about it. Uh, there are so many tips and tricks to just this one cave that I could probably spend two or three hours on it alone. I'll try and keep it down to one. <laughs> Uh, first things first, you'll notice that they aggressively use uh, meshes on the edge of these height maps. Uh, they are really rigorous about it in the cave. There are very, few, very, very few places where you can actually see the edge of the height map, and this is like the only one. And the only reason you can see that is because they wanted to make sure that you knew that that wasn't blocked. Uh, now, in terms of flow, what they've done is they've created a vestibule where you have to cross over something unusual in order to reach the deeper parts of the dungeon. And this is a very, very basic level design trick uh, that you might want to use yourself. By separating an area logically in terms of how it feels to move from area to area, you can really lodge that in the player's head. When the player crosses these rotting beams, the player knows that they are now somewhere new. So it's not a matter of just going through a doorway, uh, loading up a new level, and then running through this new level. This new level has, like, an entrance and you are entering, you're going over something, through something that is not the usual. And this sort of thing happens a lot. You have a lot of um, devs who will put in like uh, tram rides and stuff like that. You don't have to get extravagant like that. Uh, it can just be something as simple as having to walk across a chasm. Since we haven't seen water like this in the game so far, this is a great way to, to, to punch it up. Uh, this is a very well designed vestibule. Another thing I like about this are the water effects. These are incredibly cheap water effects, and uh, you can do them in any game engine you like. Uh, just look up, you know, waterfalls in Unity or UE or whatever you're using, and you'll find a whole bunch of examples of how to do it. It's an extremely straightforward UV cycling mechanic. It's, uh, it's one of the simplest things you can build in terms of effects. But notice that they're not using the effects on their own. The effects are combined with uh, others. So there are four water effects in play here. The waterfalls themselves, which you can probably see here no problem, there's a, there's a splash at the top of the waterfall where my head is. Those splashes are really valuable if you want to convince the player that the water is coming from somewhere. And then there are the splashes at the bottom which radiate out from wherever the waterfall is hitting. Uh, these splashes can be the most complicated part of this because they often consist of several effects. If you see, see that one over there, it's got a steam effect and a, um, a splash texture effect. Now the fourth is droplets. So there should be some droplets over here, I think. Yeah. So you can see that there are also droplets. So by combining these four water effects, we can get the water feeling like it has a lot of variation, even though you're using some of the most basic effects imaginable. You might have noticed this giant exclamation point. Um, this game uses really aggressive help hinting, like just, hey, come over here, because a giant floating icon tells you to. Um, I'm not sure I would have chosen that way. This is not a, um, 
uh, if you're just starting the game, it's conceivable that you would miss this. But if they had put a light up there or a torch or something, then you definitely wouldn't have missed it, and they wouldn't have needed to hint it because you would have gotten up and you know seen that this was able to be climbed. Uh, so I'm not a big fan of the really aggressive hinting like that. I prefer to build the hinting into the levels. Uh, but if you go over here, you can see that this is really well done. Uh, as you come around the corner, you can see the sky and this really, really bright skybox. There is a nice mist traveling through this area, which further brightens it. So you're going from the darkness of the cave, and you turn, and bam! That's a really, really great way to do it. Also, this tree is really well done. Uh, you can see how it is surrounded by grass and mushrooms growing on it. It's got moss drawn onto it. If you can, try and connect your trees to the ground. And I don't mean put them in the ground. I mean make sure that it feels like they belong in the ground. It's easy to plonk a tree to the ground and then wonder why it doesn't feel like it's a real tree. And the answer is probably because you haven't given it any of the things that normally grow with trees. And that might be moss or mushrooms, or ferns, or anything else. Or medicinal herbs. Ah, another fight scene. I probably could have just walked past him. I should have tried that. Oh well, I'll try it next time. Good news, those slimes are substantially weaker than the ones outside. Uh, okay, so what we're going through here is, I don't know if you've noticed this, but we don't have a shadow. Uh, inside the cave, they've changed the lighting engine to not include our shadows. And that allows them to get away with a lot of lighting tricks that they couldn't get away with otherwise. But the shadows do appear when you're near light sources. This is an interesting choice, and it means that the light in the cave feels really, really ambient uh, and soft. Um, and that's great. So uh, if you're thinking about it, you don't have to have your light sources always be direct. You can bake your light sources into the level in really, really cheap ways. You don't have to even have a light map. You can just turn ambient lighting up. You do have to be careful, though, because the more you rely on undirected lighting, uh, the, the more you have to do the lighting cues with other things, like textures. The textures of our clothes and the way that we are uh, split into different color regions makes it so that we are easy to see even in areas where lighting can't do uh, any of the hinting for us. So that's something where I'm not 100% sure that an indie dev would have an easy time duplicating it. Let's kill these guys because I want to talk about the stones to our right. Exciting. So previously I talked about how these guys aren't scared to just have meshes coming out of other meshes, and this is what I'm talking about. Uh, you can see here that they have this dark stone popping out of the brown stone, and it's literally just a dark stone cluster that's been stuck into a brown stone cluster and just however it hangs out, it hangs out. I don't know whether or not you think that looks bad, but I think it looks bad. I don't recommend that you do this if you can avoid it. Um, one of the ways you can try and avoid it is by having stones that have different textures so that your your stones might um, transition from a brown stone to a black stone texture if you are trying to do that. But it's that might be too much work, might be too many assets, it's hard to say. But normally speaking, if they have the same texture, you can overlap them without anybody ever noticing. So between Gemma and me, Gemma and me, there is a seam where they just plopped two stones together. Can you see it? You probably can't. The thing is that if they have the same texture, stones are extremely forgiving, and you can just toss them together however you like. But when they have different textures, it becomes a little bit more obvious. So, there are a lot of these underground, brightly lit caves in fiction, and they always look fantastic. In this case, I really like how they've done the lighting on this portal. You can see how it's not uh, just direct lighting. 
If you did something like this with direct lighting, you wouldn't get this wonderful glow that almost looks like this is translucent rock. Now, obviously what this uh, emulates is the fact that the light comes in and bounces around and this isn't translucent rock, it's just being lit by bounced light and it looks amazing. My guess is that they painted that light in and it's actually part of the texture, but you can also do it by just floating lights here and here inside of the room a little bit. Um, I'm not really sure exactly what method they used because I didn't, I can't really tell very clearly, but making this kind of wonderful organic glow can really help, especially if you add a little bit of mist, which they've done. So um, these kinds of caves are super popular in RPGs and the reason is because they look amazing. So we're about to get to the most interesting part of the cave from a level design perspective. And those are the interiors that are no longer broken up. Now, if we go back through the cave, you'll notice that the areas are capped off with bridges and we've been moving from bridge to bridge to bridge. But as we move into this region, there are no more bridges. It's a continuous running uh, line. And what that means is that when you come to the edge of one of the terrain chunks, you've got to figure out how to connect it to the next terrain chunk. And the way they've done that is simply replace the floor with a mesh. So, uh, oh, this is beautiful. I love how they've done this with the glowing uh, icons. Those are fantastic. The glowing lights, those are fantastic. Um, sorry, I'm trying to avoid this enemy, so I'm not talking very straight. But basically, the writing on the wall there looks fantastic. Uh, and it's, it's uh, because of the way that it doesn't have the same... Uh, luminescence as the rest of the rock. It almost feels like it's glowing. Anyway, here you can see them putting the mesh on the ground. Uh, in fact, if you look underneath that enemy's feet right there, you can actually see where the mesh uh, kind of uh, errors through the existing height map. But basically, the height map that we're on ends around here, and then there's a gap, a big old gap, and then a height map starts over here, and another height map starts over here. And so what they've done is they've just stuck a bunch of dirt and rock meshes into that gap as epoxy. They don't really have to think about how to line up the, the various pieces of their cave, as long as the various pieces of their cave have an exit that's roughly flat. They can just pave over any creases that form uh, with, with uh, meshes. Now my guess is that the height maps actually drop off here back into the water and so if we could dive through this dirt we would see a cliff face and in the past what they've done is where this rock is there would be a bridge but instead what they've done here is they've just paved it over and made it into a solid object and that's a sign that we're going deeper into the cave uh, into more um, hidden regions here you can see more of that um, more of that black gray rock uh, not sure why they did that. So this kind of um, side area is a lot of fun. This one's kind of pointless, but it teaches you that you can smash pots, which I guess is why they made it. Um, but you can't go swimming or anything, so it's literally just a dead end. It may be that at some time in the future of the game you can drain this. I haven't played it through or anything. But you certainly can't do it in the first chapter. Um, still, having that kind of short fork uh, does reward the player for exploring and notice that you can see the short fork from where are we you can see the short fork from up here when you look down uh, you can see how it kind of curls around and then as you move you can steadily see more and more of where you're going it's a it's a wonderful little side fork with a wonderful little reward but you're not punished for missing it because there's nothing really of interest down there you can tell which way is forward because you've got a dog leading you your indie game may not have a dog barking at you to tell you which way to go, in which case you might have to indicate which way is forward in a different manner. Um, notice these are all edged. These height maps are all edged with meshes. Uh, and we've got like some kind of sunken ruin down there that's really neat. I like it. I imagine we'll see a lot more of that sunken ruin mesh set later on in the game. Over here you can see some flat rocks. People underestimate flat rocks where this thing I'm standing on. Um, flat rocks are really, really useful for a lot of different purposes, and you don't have to make them look quite this artificial. This one looks like it was flattened on purpose. You can also make them look like this, where it's just 
a rock that happens to be flat. These flat rocks are extraordinarily useful for putting on the edges of rock faces or you know, paving between areas that have a seam, stuff like that. You can really, really use them a lot. And those particular flat rocks are probably just those rocks that you can see next to our enemy friend, those right there. It's probably the same rocks that you see there, just sunken into the ground so you can't see their depth. Once again, these meshes are hiding a seam. This is a wonderful piece of hinting where you're coming around here and you're wondering whether to go right or left, but there's something, there's a, first off, there's a bright light to the right and there's also a glowing sparkle to the right. So it's like, if you're coming through here and you're saying, oh, look at, there's light, let's go that way. What's that? Oh my gosh. That's really well done. I think the hinting is great. I'm not sure what's up with this little plug. I wonder whether or not, I mean, it looks so like it's an ob obviously a tunnel that's been plugged up with a rock. I wonder if they did that just to save time or whether or not that is something you, that you can clear away later. Here you can see them paving over another seam. Oh, ah. I want more, more of this. I love these. These are great. Uh, let's just move on. I don't want to get into a fight. I just want to push through. Oh no, it's the fog monster. You know what? I am going to stop here. I wanted to talk a little bit more about uh, the next portion of the level, which is a vertical portion of the level where you can look back and see stuff you've missed. But it's not really as impressive as the cave from a level design perspective. It features some more picketed off areas that are really well done. Um, but I'll probably die if I try and fight this guy since I haven't leveled at all. So we're going to stop here and uh, I will just upload this part. If, uh, if anybody cares, I will do a city tour and upload that. Um, but, you know, it really depends on whether or not there's any interest in me going through levels like this and mumbling to myself for half an hour straight. Anyway, have fun.